Deuxième présentation, Lauren Engli, Lauren Egli, étudiante au doctorat sous la direction de Timothy Works. Forest harvest causes rapid change of material investment strategies in ground beetles. Uh, hi everyone, so over the last few years I've been looking at how rapidly remnant populations recover after harvesting. So I thought I'd start with just a quick overview of one of my studies, which is um, how ground beetles have recovered in their biodiversity over 20 years, which was part of the SAFE project. And then I'll spend the rest of the presentation talking about my recent follow-up about how CPRS harvesting can cause um, rapid evolution in remnant populations. Uh, both parts of my study took place at the Lake Dubarquet Research and Teaching Forest, which is just 40 kilometers north of here. The SAFE project, which I would guess a lot of you are familiar with, uh, started back in the late 90s when hardwood, mixed wood, and softwood stands were harvested through partial cutting as well as um, CPRS, and then also some additional manipulations of logging residues like um, whole tree harvest or uh, prescribed burning. In this project, we collected ground beetles every five years, and over that amount of time, we have collected and identified 70,000 ground beetles. Here's my fancy regression tree, but uh, I'll just give you guys the bottom line in the interest of time. Um, in the hardwood stands, the one-third and two-third retentions recovered after five years, the CPRS recovered after 10 years, and the burn and whole tree harvest recovered after 20 years. And while that's good news, it's still a significant amount of time for the impacts of harvesting to be acting on these like remnant populations. So now I'll tell you about my follow-up study. Um, I'll show you through a series of experiments that CPRS harvesting can cause changes in the fecundity of ground beetles, so that's the number of eggs they lay or the quality of the eggs, as well as changes in the offspring's development and offspring survival. And then I'll talk about um, how these changes might be able to help them under climate change scenarios. So as we all know, climate, or CPRS causes a bunch of different changes to the environmental conditions. Um, and while this can have immediate impacts on their survival, it can also go further and impact the evolution of the species. Recent studies have found that evolution can occur with a pretty short time scale. And this kind of rapid evolution is easier to see in organisms which mature quickly. Uh, beetles are a great example. These uh, is the life cycle of beetles, uh, the mature Adults lay eggs, they go through a couple stages of larva, and then they pupate, pupation similar to when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, but instead of emerging as a butterfly, they come out as beetles. Uh, <laughs> uh, that whole process takes a little under a year, so you get a lot of fast turnover, um, and this kind of rapid turnover, um, you really need to see that to be able to see evolution occurring on the short time scale. You can't really see it in something like mammals that take a lot of years to mature. Um, and when organisms like this with this rapid turnover have big changes in their environmental conditions, like we see with CPRS, um, it can place new evolutionary pressures on these populations. There's a couple avenues that this rapid evolution can act on. So one is changes to the female's fecundity. Um, so for example, they could lay more eggs, which could help offset um, increased mortality because the offspring got too hot, something like that. We can also have changes to the offspring development. So maybe they mature faster so that they spend less time as these little fragile life forms baking in the sun. So this study, I wanted to see if um, rapid evolution was happening in either of these ways. And if it is, there's some big scale implications. If we can figure out how these remnant populations are evolving, we might be able to manage forests in a way that play towards those adaptations. Um, and this way we can help speed up recovery or we can even maybe preserve specialists that might otherwise be lost. Additionally, if CPRS is causing rapid evolution in remnant populations that's helping them adapt to hot or dry conditions, that might help preserve these populations under climate change because they'd already be adapted to handle some of those situations. Uh, for our study, we picked ground beetles because they respond rapidly to changes in environmental conditions like forest composition and structure changes or soil moisture and temperature. I picked these two species specifically, um, Terosticus pennsylvanicus we chose because they're a generalist. That means that in this case they live in undisturbed habitats but they also do pretty well in clear cuts or plantations or even road edges. They're also a spring breeding species which means that they lay their eggs in the spring. They go through all those stages of development during the summer so they're full mature adults before the winter comes, so they pass the winter as adults. 
Pterosticus coracinus, on the other hand, is a habitat specialist. Uh, we know they prefer undisturbed habitats or at least closed canopies. They're also an autumn breeding species, uh, which means that they go through uh, just the larval stage until winter. They overwinter as larva, and then they don't mature to adults until the following spring. For this study, we uh, selected three uncut stands and three stands which were cut through CPRS five to six years prior to the study. In each one of those stands, we put 25 pitfall traps, so a total of 75 per treatment. From those traps, the adults were collected every 48 hours. I then put them in pairs where both parents were from the CPRS or both parents were from the uncut stand, collected eggs every week, and then put all of those eggs in incubation chambers. Once the eggs hatched, I took some of those larvae and I reared them in a common garden experiment. That's when you take them and you rear them in common conditions adjacent to each other. And this allows us to kind of untangle the results, um, whether it's from the like parents' genetics or it's from the habitat. So for example, if you had larvae from CPRS parents reared in the same conditions as one from uncut and our CPRS developed faster, we would know that that could be something that they've adapted and evolved rather than they were just warmer or they had more food, something like that. Then I took another subset of the larvae and I reared them in a reciprocal transplant. A reciprocal transplant in this case is when we take larvae and we rear them in the same habitat their parents came from, but we also transplant other ones into the novel habitat. And this allowed us to look and see whether any of these adaptations they may have evolved actually are helping them when we're out in the field. Uh, so for, in the, for the fecundity experiment, where we took those adults, paired them up, let them lay eggs, I specifically looked at the number of eggs laid per female, how long the eggs took to hatch, and then how many of them hatched. And I included not just the habitat they came from, but I also included the mom's body size, because how big she is uh, can affect how many eggs she can keep, and that kind of thing, so we just wanted to account for it. In the common garden experiment, uh, so that's when they were reared in the little cups in the lab, I looked at, uh, let's see, the speed of development and their overall lifespan and saw if that differed by where the parents were from or the mom's body size again. And in the reciprocal transplant, um, which is where they were transplanted out into the field, I looked at if their ability to survive was affected by their parents' habitat, mom's size, and then also the habitat they were raised in. So we'll get into some results. I'll start with the habitat generalist, which as a reminder, abundant in uncut and cut habitat, passes the winter as an adult. So for the generalist, we found no impact of the type of harvest or mom size on the number of eggs laid or the time it took them to hatch. But we did see that the offspring from or let's see, the females from the CPRS laid more eggs which actually hatched, and then also small females laid more eggs which actually hatched. Additionally, uh, we found a big effect of where the parents came from on how long it took the offspring to develop in the common garden. We found that offspring from CPRS parents developed faster. However, for the ones that were raised in the field, it didn't really matter where your parents were from. Survival turned out pretty much the same for the generalist. Uh, so now let's talk about the specialist, which as a reminder, prefers closed canopy and spends the winter as a larva. So for the specialist overall, we found that those small females from the CPRS invested a lot into their eggs. For example, the small females from the CPRS laid a bunch more eggs, more of those eggs hatched, and they hatched faster. Uh, a possible downside to this fast growth is that in the common garden, we found that the offspring with CPRS parents had shorter lifespans. We also found that in both the parents' habitat and the rearing habitat had a really big impact on offspring survival in the field. So the offspring with CPRS parents raised in the CPRS had only a 4% probability of survival. Uh, offspring with non-uncut parents raised in the uncut stand jumped up to a 16% chance of survival. But when we raised them in the habitat that was opposite from what their parents were from, survival jumped up to over 30%. Few overall conclusions we can take away from all of this. First of all, females from the CPRS do seem to be investing a lot into their eggs. They laid more eggs, they hatched faster, um, and more of them hatched. And the hot, dry conditions in the CPRS are probably causing the remnant populations to evolve this trait because 
If they mature more quickly, they spend less time baking in the sun as these little fragile forms. And that adaptation also points towards CPRS potentially helping these remnant populations survive under climate change because they've already adapted in some ways to handle these hotter and drier conditions. There is a potential downside to this adaptation. Females which invest more in their eggs um, burn more of their energy reserves, so could be fat reserves, or they actually can even metabolize their wing muscles if they need them. So while the offspring of the female probably have increased survival, the females themselves might be less resilient to any additional disturbances because they don't have these reserves built in. Another big trend we saw was that those best eggs, particularly the ones laid by the small CPRS females, um, came from the small ones. Conditions following CPRS are probably selecting for small females because metabolic demands really increase in insects with size. They also increase in the same trend with temperature. And because of those increases are additive, if it's hot out, it's a lot better to be small and hot than it is to be big and hot because it's really hard to meet that greatly increased metabolic demand. And that's another way that CPRS harvesting could be pushing evolution in a way that could be helpful for climate change because we'd have more of those small females in the population which can handle it. In terms of how CPRS varied between generalist and specialist for the impacts, on the whole we saw that the specialist did um, have stronger impacts. Not only did they lay higher quality eggs, they laid a really large number of eggs. Um, because we know the specialist prefers a closed canopy, it's probable that those first few years after CPRS are really stressful for them, so that would be a strong selective pressure to cause them to lay more eggs. Additionally, I think this is really interesting, because they have to pass the winter as a larva, they can't adapt by shortening the amount of time they spend as a larva, which is what the generalists did. So their only avenue for adaptation is probably towards laying more eggs because they just don't have anything else available to them. Also in the specialist, we found that really big impact of if the larva was reared in a novel habitat, survival jumped up a lot. Couple possible explanations for why this could happen. Um, if the parents were from the CPRS, we know that they invested a lot in their offspring. So if those ones were raised in that uncut stand, which is less stressful, that could boost survival. The other direction is a little harder to explain. It's possible that the uncut stands, since they're less disturbed, are allowing more old females to survive. We do know in ground beetles, females that are more than two have higher quality offspring, so maybe that's boosting survival, but I don't really know. Whichever the cause is, though, uh, it does seem clear that offspring survival in that specialist can be boosted in both the CPRS and the uncut populations if the stands are adjacent to each other and allow the females to move across. So allowing uh, access of that interface could help a boost not just the specialist population, but both populations, because when you have that interface between them, that brought survival up to more than double what we found in just the uncut stands alone. So that interface might be a really helpful thing for um, improving their survival under climate change situations, because it would boost their survival quite a bit. Thanks to all of my funders, and I'll be around at the end of the block for questions.